Hey everybody, Russ with strategyfiend.com. Okay, beginner series. Whoops. Volume 3. Got a little housekeeping to do before we get into it um, too far. I'm going to set up the board here, which I probably could have done before I started recording, but I didn't. So, there. Uh, we didn't talk about the castling move, and so let's do that now. Uh, the agenda for this video will be a little bit of housekeeping, talking about castling, talking about um, uh, touch move, and then I'm going to go into um, piece values and um, and uh, you know sort of opening opening um, principles. So that's a lot to cover. So I'm going to go quick. Okay, so castling, provided that the king and rook have not moved then the king may choose to move two squares in either direction. There can't be any pieces in between. Obviously, these, we know these. We've, we've looked at the first two videos. If we haven't, we, we go back and look at them now and come back. Uh, or we just know. Um, so king moves two, and the rook goes on the other side of it. It's the only time in chess when you can move two pieces um, a lot of people don't like to do it because they feel like they're trapped in the corner, but I'm telling you, you should do it. So the other rules on um, castling. King can't have moved, rook can't have moved. You cannot castle into, out of, or through check. So you cannot land on a square where you would be captured. You cannot leave a square where you're being checked in check. Um, did I even t talk about this? Check, you know, it's... Uh, you know, if, uh, if I take here, I'm attacking the king, that's check. Uh, subtlety is that you don't actually have to say check. You usually see in TV, they always say check. It's a courtesy to say it. Some people are annoyed by it because they feel like, oh, I can see it. But it's a courtesy, so I don't know why anybody can be annoyed by a courtesy. But you, you're not required to say it. Uh, why is that important? Because, let's say... Um, We'll, we'll get into the touch move rule. If you can touch, if you touch a piece, and you can legally move it, you're required to do so. So well, if you don't notice you're in check, and you're going to come down here, and then, well, you're going to come right here, and your opponent says, "Hey, you're in check. You've touched your queen, and the only thing, the only legal move you have is here." So that's how that's where that comes into play. So now we've even covered the touch move. Um, how it relates to castling is that you need to touch your king first when you castle. If you touch the rook first um, and put it here, if you're playing on a computer, it's just going to put your rook there. Now you won't be able to castle. At least not to that side. Um, if you're playing against your opponent and you pick up your rook and try and set it here, they may just tell you, sorry, you got to move your rook. Or they, they, may, they may say, ha ha ha. Who knows? You can castle to either side of the board, so um, make a few moves here, and it works the same way on the queen side. King moves two, rook goes to the other side. Same deal. Okay, so you, you may not castle, make sure I cover this, you may not castle into, out of, or through check. Not on a place king can't land on a place where it would be captured, can't uh, go through a square where it would be captured, and cannot be leaving check to castle. Okay. Um, what is this game of chess all about? The idea is to checkmate the opponent's king. You never actually capture the opponent's king. The opponent is in checkmate when you've attacked it, and it has no defense against it. Uh, the three ways of defending against check are to um, move, to uh, block, or to capture the piece giving check. If none of those three things are can be done legally, then the game is over. And the king who is in check, um, that, that side has lost, obviously. So there's two kinds of outcomes to a game. There's the, the victor and loser situation, and then we have a draw. There's some ways to get a draw, several ways. Um, <clears throat> one of them is by stalemate. If there are no legal moves for a player and they are not in check, 
then that would be a stalemate and that would be considered a draw. Um, you can draw by repetition, so if the same position occurs three times with the same player to move, either player may claim a draw. Um, if one player lacks enough material to inflict checkmate, say they have just a king and a knight or just a king and a bishop, that's insufficient material to, to create a checkmate, the other player can create a, can claim a draw. Um, there's a 50 move rule where if either player makes 50 consecutive moves without making a pawn move or making a capture, then either player may claim a draw. This happens you know, in end games, obviously, when there's few pieces left on the board, there's probably no pawns left on the board. A good example is king and queen versus king and rook. Um, it's uh, uh, actually a very tough, tough um, end game to win because of that 50 move rule. If you don't know what you're doing, you slip up and let them get back to the middle of the board, then they can they can weasel out. Uh, you can also draw by agreement. If both players realize that there's just no further progress to be made, they can just agree to a draw. Or sometimes they're just in a position that both of them know to be draw. They both know the method, and they just don't go through with it. They just they just draw. Um, we didn't cover two ways of winning um, other than checkmate. One is resignation. Your opponent can simply resign knowing that they've got a lost game. Um, this will happen if they blunder a queen early or something like that, or if they can just see that there's a mate in three moves, they'll resign. Um, chess is a game that's played on a clock, and if you run out of time, they call that uh, your flag falling, um, then, then you lose the game. So, um, for those of you who don't know, the way the clock works uh, on chess is you both have your own individual timer, and when it's your move, your clock is running, you hit the clock, your clock stops running, it starts their clock, and uh, when they hit make their move, then they hit the clock and it stops theirs, starts yours, so on and so forth. If, if somebody's flag falls because they've run out of time, then they lose. If for some reason nobody notices that those flags have fallen and they end up both falling and somebody looks over and says, hey look, both our flags are down, either player can claim a draw at that point, um, provided they're not in checkmate. So I think that covers that. Um, and now let's jump into piece values. Um, there's two types of piece values. There is, um, you know, an absolute value, and then there's a relative value. We're going to focus really um, just on relative value because, uh, or absolute value rather, because relative value is a little bit complex to understand. But I'll just tell you what it is. Um, if if you have a piece that's very active and well placed and creating havoc for your opponent, it's a good piece. If you have a piece that's trapped somewhere in its corner and has no way to get out safely and just can't participate in the game, it's a bad piece. If both of those pieces are knights, they're not going to have the same value in that particular situation. So that would be relative value. I'm not going to get into any examples of that in this video, but um, that's as far as we'll go. Absolute value is what we say if, you know, all things being equal, a pawn is worth one. A rook would be worth five, so we would say a rook would be worth five pawns. Um, you know, again, conditions come into play. Would you trade a rook for five pawns? You know, maybe. Um, the bishops and the knights are both worth three, and um, the queen is worth nine. The king doesn't have a numerical value because if your king is gone, you're done. So infinite? I don't know. Um, it's worth noting that two bishops are typically worth more than um, having a bishop and a knight. So in other words, it's generally um, a priority for a lot of players to maintain both bishops. Um, you, when you hear people talking about assessing a position, they'll say, I have the bishop pair. Uh, they work really well together. So think a little bit before you um, trade off your bishop for a knight. Despite their equal value, um, uh, you may want to try and keep it keep it on the board. I'll give you an example um, of where that decision comes into play. This is the Spanish opening, and it typically proceeds this way. What's happened is that um, white moved out, 
I just zipped back to the beginning in case you're wondering what just happened. Um, white moved out, black moved out, white attacked the pawn, black defended the pawn, white, um, again a topic for another lecture, um, attacked the defender of the pawn, so threatening to remove the defender and thereby win the pawn, even though for reasons I'll miss talking about right now, that's actually not a, a real threat um, in this particular case. And uh, because it's not, black offers white the opportunity to go through with it. So um, white could go ahead and play this exchange variation. Um, and I, I guess I will show you why it's not actually a threat, because now both pieces can't be saved. And the pawn is one back. So that could happen. Um, you know, you could just go ahead and, and exchange. People do play this way, um, especially if they're really strong in the end game. Um, the end game specific to this uh, starting, this opening. Um, but more often than not, they retreat. And um, part of the reasoning for that is to, to maintain the bishop pair. So, now let's talk about the phases of the game, and hopefully I'm making this all make sense and making it all short. I feel like I'm going along, and I feel like I'm talking fast, which is some sort of crazy conflict that's, that's uh, boggling my mind. Okay, the beginning of the game is called the opening, the middle is called the middle game, and the ending is called the ending. That is not exactly code. So when do we get out of the opening and into the middle is where we'll start. And that is when we get to a position where we are, our pieces are developed, we're castled, and our rooks can see each other. This is important to remember, so rewind and uh, get that down. These are our goals for the opening. Pieces developed, castled, rooks can see each other. So we're going to make one or two pawn moves only, and we're going to play to affect the center. We're always going to be trying to do things that influence our role in the center, um, whatever that may be. So I'm just making kind of random moves that do that, and not paying a whole lot of attention to tactical. There may be some situations where I'm moving into... Um, tactical situations where I could lose pieces or lose material, whatever, but I'm just kind of going through this to show you what I'm talking about in terms of development. And so for white, white is now completed development. Um, rooks can see each other, all the pieces are out, and the, uh, the king is castled. So now we can start looking at middle game plans. Play to control the center you know, by making moves with knights towards the center, here or here, um, by, you know, avoiding things like blocking in pawns that block bishops, these sorts of things, moving knights t towards the outside of the board where they can't even reach the center, avoid those kinds of things, and um, you'll have a good fighting chance for the center. Okay, so give that a whirl, and um, if you have any questions, I know I went really fast. If you if you have any questions, or if I was unclear on something, or if I just flat out skipped right over something, uh, leave a question or a comment in the um, box below. Thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to hit the like button and the subscribe button, and um, I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.